despite doing jujitsu for 25 years now, Brazilian jujitsu is not my favorite style of grappling. In fact, I have some serious problems with it, but all those problems are answered by another style of grappling that I trained briefly, which I'm going to get into right now, which in my opinion is the best form of grappling out there. So stay tuned because this video is on catch as can wrestling. Pow, pow, inside. Inside fighting, yeah, dangerous, dangerous martial arts. Pow, pow, pow. Ooh, ah. Catch as can wrestling. Let's jump right in to the history of this style because it has a very cool history, and I think the history contributes to why it's such an effective uh, grappling system. And when I say effective grappling system, from my personal perspective, I don't necessarily mean for sport grappling. I mean for self defense or you know, sport MMA based where there's actual strikes or there's a need to finish someone quickly. Catch as can has some very unique properties to it. So the history of catch as can wrestling is somewhat lost. There's a lot of different accounts from what I research. If someone out there wants to debate this, that's fine. But what I did find is that there's this guy, John Graham Chambers, who started popularizing it in the UK in the 1800s, early 1800s. And as it became popular, it eventually came to the United States. And he's the one who introduced the new rule sets. Catch as can pretty much means catch whatever submission you can. Oddly enough, they didn't allow chokeholds more often than not, but they did allow arm bars and leg locks, which is almost the opposite of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But interestingly, what you see in Sambo, and there's, a, I believe, a little bit of a tie over there. But what I do know is that catch as can kind of developed over the years into the early 1900s, where it came to the United States. When it came to the United States, this is where it gets very cool. It became a very popular carnival style of wrestling. Now, carnivals back then were not what carnivals are today. They weren't a bunch of eight-year-old kids, you know, throwing darts at a wall to win prizes. There were competitions, and it was a lot more extreme. And so what you had is, my dog is literally licking my leg right now as uh, as I film this. And it's, it's kind of awkward. But I'll, So if you see my head kind of rocking, it's because she's licking me extremely hard. Maybe one day she'll get a cameo in a video. Anyway. Um, so carnivals back then had competitions for wrestlers to try and pin down or submit somebody. Uh, and it was like an open challenge and they'd win money this way. That's how they made their living. Now, if you look at that, pinning someone down could often be debated. They could say, oh, the carnival cheated. They were biased. It's also a lot harder to just hold someone down than to get them to submit. And when someone submits, it's not debatable. If someone's screaming out in pain to stop then you know you won the match. And it would also end it quicker. So they were incentivized to end the match however they could. And this is where the term no holds barred, literally, like the, the reason people say no holds barred fighting means there's literally no holds barred. We're going to allow any type of hold or submission, meaning we'll allow chokes, we'll allow arm bars, we'll allow foot locks. And so that's where that phrase comes from, no holds barred directly correlates to tapping people out, meaning no holds are barred. It's common sense, but for some reason it never clicked in my mind until I started researching catches can. Now, uh, what I will say is they're, what they call submissions, they call them hooking. They're hooks. They're hookers. And they like to go hooking. Anyway, a hook is pretty much the exact same thing as a submission. The difference in mentality is that it's applied very quickly and very aggressively. And that's a fundamental difference as opposed to jujitsu. And even in some ways, Sambo, which I'll get into later. Uh, Sambo highly influenced my grappling system. Just a little bit about me. I have about 24 years in grappling, 24, 25 years in grappling. I've done Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I'm a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. That's the first style of grappling I did. I have a very cool lineage. Uh, it's influenced by Carlson Gracie and Hickson Gracie. Their students taught me. Uh, and so I think that I have a very good understanding of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I also have, in recent years, come to terms with a lot of limitations of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But I also have a bit of a background with combat submission wrestling, kind of Eric Paulson approach to wrestling, which is heavily influenced by catch as can the Josh Barnett approach to wrestling, which is a catch as can form of wrestling. And I'm going to go into the benefits of that versus Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So as I said, my background is I have trained Sambo, I have trained Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and I've trained combat submission wrestling. And I'm going to actually get into this more in another video, but one of my problems with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu lately is just how sport-based it's become. And that's a normal issue that will come 
from a system that becomes as popularized as jujitsu. It used to be this kind of cool secret when I first started training in the 90s. It was impossible to find instructors. If someone was a purple belt, it was like they were a god. They were a superhero. They were invincible. And now a purple belt means nothing. And so the system had a little bit of mystique to it at the time, which has disappeared. And because of that, it's become so popularized as a sport that people have highly optimized Brazilian jiu-jitsu for sport, not for fighting. And again, the purpose of a system and how effective it is for street fighting will be influenced by how people are practicing that system. And in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, because the nature of jiu-jitsu itself is very intellectual, it's very chess, you take your time, you... Uh, you look for submissions, but you get very technical, very into the body mechanics, very into the movement and like 15 steps ahead. Now that's wonderful, but that always doesn't always translate to a self-defense situation. I, I have always said that 95 to 99% of what you need in jujitsu for a street fight, you should know by blue belt. Everything after that, everything blue belt plus, if you're a good blue belt, after that, what you're learning is to beat other people who do jujitsu. So by the time you're a purple belt, you're optimized at beating a, a purple belt, hopefully a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You're optimized at brown belt to hopefully start attacking black belts and brown belts and definitely what purple belts and below. So there's this kind of trend where in jiu-jitsu, you optimize your system as you get better to beat other people in jiu-jitsu. But sometimes that comes at the compromise of no longer using a closed guard with an overhook and being tight, but inverting onto your neck. And you can't do that on concrete or going for submissions that are a lot more dangerous and guards that are a lot more complex. When you're a little bit more beginner, you're more fundamental in nature. You keep a closed guard, butterfly guard, overhooks, cross collar, uh, sleeve grip. And these are fundamental grips that are more applicable to a self-defense situation. Okay, I've gone on my jiu-jitsu rant. There's a lot of problems with Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Because of the nature of catches, Ken, having to finish people quickly. And again, this is something that translates. You see it in judo on the ground and you see it in sambo on the ground. They don't spend... 25 minutes of a match on the ground. There's no super fights where 20 minutes are spent just seeking for a submission. In catches, Ken, you have to finish people quickly. You have to finish them aggressively. And the nature, again, of a submission was to rip the joint, you know, to hurt the person. It, create, it, it incentivizes a more self-defense-based approach to wrestling. Another thing about catches, Ken, which is fantastic, that's lacking in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is it's wrestling. And wrestling focuses heavily on takedowns. And it's a huge part of catch as can wrestling. Uh, it's equally as important as what you do on the ground. And again, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, the biggest problem I have with jiu-jitsu nowadays is the complete denial of takedowns. And I understand takedowns get you injured. I tore my ACL and my meniscus and my hamstring all at once. They ripped, oddly enough, in a sambo tournament on a takedown. Uh, and so there is a fear there for sure for a lot of people. Of, I don't want to hurt my knees. I don't want to hurt my shoulders. And that's where you get injured on takedowns. But it's a fundamental part of fighting and there are ways to train it safe. Another thing about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu versus catch as can wrestling is that if you look at the nature of Jiu-Jitsu, people have always told this to me, Jiu-Jitsu is 20% strength, 80% technique. In other words, if you think about it, strength plays a huge part. I'm not one of these proponents of anyone can beat anyone of any size. But if you look how people roll or how they spar, they don't spar 100%, 100% of the time. What they're doing is they're, if they're good, they're, again, treating it like a chess match. And they're not putting as much effort in. They're preserving energy because you might spend 25 minutes on the ground with this person. And so that is a more fluid, more more constant and slow in jujitsu can be fast, but it's not as energy, energy, energy as if you look at a wrestling match. Wrestling matches are 80% strength and conditioning, 20% technique. And I know there's going to be wrestlers who are pissed at me for saying that, but wrestling is very, very technical, but it's more explosive in nature. It's more aggressive in nature. And catch as can has that mentality where it's take down, submit, take down, submit, clinch up, take down, submit. It's aggressive. And I, I think that's super important and something that's lacking a lot of the times nowadays. If, and it's also why a lot of jujitsu tournaments are not exciting to the mainstream because you see guys sitting there like going into guard, you know, uh, not to put down someone like a Mikey Musumeci, he's an incredible grappler, but even Gordon Ryan, they all just kind of sit there and his last right fight with Nicky Rod, where you just kind of, it was a 20 minute, just sitting there going for a leg lock and Nicky defending and then getting the toe hold on. Nicky got the toe hold on him. I'm going on a rant. Anyway, there's a lot of butt scooting, sitting down and just kind of playing 
guard and people become very defensive. And again, 99% of the system becomes, can this guy pass your guard or can you, can you keep him in your guard and tap him with nowadays? Interestingly enough, and here's something also about catches can, which is super important to me. When I started jujitsu about 25 years ago, after about five years, I had been doing Sambo also. I was leg locking everyone in jujitsu. They just didn't seem to want to touch leg locks 20 years ago. It's very hard to convince people to roll with leg locks. And when they rolled with them, they didn't know what they were doing. And I'm not even talking about heel hooks. When I started with heel hooks, people would get so pissed at me. And they, they just didn't seem to want to evolve in that way until leg locks became trendy in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Well, in catches can wrestling, leg locks were a fundamental part from the beginning because they're a very, very effective limb to attack and also in sambo. And so now what's becoming popular in Brazilian jiu-jitsu is wrist locks because wrists are a great thing to attack. They're not as strong as your elbow when your bicep. You know, when you think about an arm bar, you're attacking the bicep, you're attacking the tricep, you're attacking the shoulder because the guy can fight with those muscles, right? So I'm fighting right now with my bicep. And as I pull, I'm kind of fighting with my tricep, my chest and shoulders are involved, my forearms involved. So there's all these muscles protecting an arm bar. And if you've, you've ever tried to submit somebody who's significantly bigger than you with an armbar, it's hard. It is a lot of work to get that arm cracked. Um, but if you look at a wrist lock, the most they can resist with are the muscles from here to here. That's it. That's all they have to fight you. And once it bends a little bit, it's heavily compromised. And it's a scary submission because it causes damage quick. It's kind of like the heel hook of the wrist. And again, it's something that people in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu didn't want to touch until now. And it's something that's been around forever in catches can. And I learned a lot of cool wrist locks when I trained combat submission wrestling uh, and a lot of different approaches. Now, I want to get into some of my inspirations for grappling and especially catch as can because that's what this video is about. So you look at Carl Gotch and Billy Robinson. They popularized catch as can wrestling throughout Japan and the United States. And those fighters that they created, the Shinya Aoki's, the... Uh, Sakurabas, the, again, the Barnett's, Josh Barnett. They're such amazing fighters that came out of these camps and tough dudes. And actually they were, you know, Kazushi Sakuraba was the answer to jujitsu early on in those uh, early MMA fights. He was the, the Gracie killer. And there's a reason for it. There's a reason why catch wrestling was so effective early on. Um, and in fact, my opinion of modern day submission grappling tournaments, people keep saying they're jujitsu tournaments. You know, like you look at all the tournaments that Gordon Ryan's winning. And uh, these are tournaments that are influenced by the rules of catch as can wrestling. Then they are more than Brazilian jiu-jitsu because Brazilian jiu-jitsu historically gi based system didn't really focus on leg locks, definitely didn't allow heel hooks. You look at the IBJJF rules, they still don't allow reaps. And again, not as takedown focused. And now there's a lot of new systems coming out uh, that are kind of promoting rule sets that are very conducive to catch as can wrestling. So in my opinion, catch as can wrestling is a winner style of grappling for the following reasons. The aggressiveness of the style is unbelievable. It allows you to have a focal point of going from A to Z, which is I'm going to start on my feet, I'm going to take you down, and I'm going to finish you quickly. Because it comes from those carnival approach to having to finish multiple fighters in a day quickly, the whole hooking approach to fighting, which is do the submission aggressively, quickly, make them scream, and it's done. Number two, it focuses on submissions that are very, very strong for the person attacking and weak for the person defending. And this has been my approach to jujitsu, ju to grappling. Ever since I actually watched, and as much as people want to bash this guy, I watched the old Tony Kashini, Tony, I don't know how to say his last name. He's got these, these instructional videos. And if you're a beginner in Brazilian jiu-jitsu or just getting into grappling, they're worth watching. People bash this guy. They say he's a fake. But his understanding of body mechanics and of kind of applying pressure and all these things he does are fantastic, in my opinion. And it kind of changed the way I saw jiu-jitsu early on. And again, he does like, for an example, he doesn't do an Americana attacking by grabbing the wrist. He grabs, if the wrist is here, he's grabbing it and turning it out this way. Now, if you look, my, my arm naturally will come down. If I take your wrist and I do this, it naturally comes down. See? 
he does it this way. It's just hard to show on camera. So I went that way, but he goes like this. In other words, the wrist makes the move, the arm move. It makes it much harder to defend. If I'm here and you try and pull my arm down, I'm strong. But if you take my wrist and do this, I can't even use my arm to defend you anymore. That's a catch principle, right? Do it to yourself or get a friend to just turn your wrist out and try and fight your arm and they'll slowly take it down. And I'll actually do a video on this. It's one of the first things I teach people is how to from side control, from neon belly, how to really kind of pin people down. And it's a catch approach to fighting. Um, and I love that they use smaller joint manipulation to control the bigger parts of the body. The other thing I love about it, again, like I said, it's, it's very takedown oriented. It's a wrestling 80, 20 approach and, you know, take people down, submit them on the ground, but you need that first step, which is the takedown. Um, and again, I love that they are not blind to the idea of striking being part of the system. Is that something that's sorely lacking in a lot of jujitsu schools nowadays, which becomes so sport oriented that your positions don't take into account that someone can hit you here, right? Like you're, in, you're inverting, uh, going for like an inverted triangle and the guy could just start punching you in the head, just dropping punches down to your head. If you're training that way, and Ryan Hall said, you know, do you think I would really do that in a fight? If you're training that way every day, day in, day out, to beat guys who are amazing at jiu-jitsu, then that will be your instinct because you're you're training it to become instinct. That's the only way you're going to beat people who are that good at jiu-jitsu. But you're compromising, again, what you'll do in a real fight to do that. You're on concrete in a real fight. And there's people punching you in the head in a real fight. And Catch kind of understands that. And if you look at the positions there, they're more fundamental. And my last thing that I will say about catch wrestling, which I love, is that they see submissions from everywhere. They don't care if they're on the bottom or the top. They are submission. I'm going to say this, and I know I'm going to get flack for it. The, the saying in jiu-jitsu was always position before submission. If you look at guys like Jean-Jacques Machado, who's a big influence of mine. I got my brown belt from Gary Padilla, who's under Jean-Jacques. Jean-Jacques Machado has a machine gun approach. He chains submission together. And chaining is a catch principle. They believe in keep trying to submit. You get rolled onto your back, continue with the submission, go to the next submission. That will open up your opportunities to get better position. And that's something that I love about catch wrestling. So in my opinion, catch wrestling covers so many valuable aspects and it's no gi. And for street self-defense, sorry, I went on one more, but no gi for street self-defense is in my opinion, a better way to train. Sambo is an unbelievable system. There's so many similarities between Sambo and catch wrestling. Um, but I will say that I find training without the gi will prepare you for more situations than being dependent on it because you won't always have someone wearing a jacket. And so train for the worst case scenario, which is your no holds barred techniques will work regardless of what the person is wearing. You don't want to have to think of what do I grip in this moment? And uh, that's my video. I hope you liked this video. I uh, hope you subscribe to the channel and I hope you share this video. Thanks so much for watching.